Hey guys, it's me, Seren, back with another video. So today is the other Wednesday, which makes it Hidden Figures Day. And today's Hidden Figure, since it is Halloween today, I wanted to be a sort of kind of cool, fun um, Halloween edition of Hidden Figures. So I decided to do Marlene Clark. So Marlene Clark played Ganja in Ganja and Hess, which we watched for one of our Halloween uh, Beast Bake live streams. And I, w I was doing some reading up about her and I saw that she was actually in quite a few sort of horror, sci-fi, sort of like Fright Night films. And yet I didn't know very much about her and I didn't know very much about her roles. And I felt like she was somewhat of a scream queen hidden figure you know we hear a lot about scream queens like that are in people that are in like a lot women women actresses that are in a lot of like horror films as like the lead and yet I had never heard too much about Marlene Clark so I decided to, I wanted to do a hidden figures on her there actually isn't a ton of information about her because she doesn't do very many interviews but I actually found a pretty good and in-depth interview that I'm gonna read you guys some blurbs from so that you guys can hear a little bit more about Marlene Clark and learn a little bit more about her career so but before I even start with the blurb I'm just gonna let you guys know that she was born on December 19th 1949 which makes her a Sag woo -woo, and New York City and she was raised in Harlem before she was an actress she was also a fashion model so let me go ahead and get into this um, interview it's hard to believe that actress Marlene Clark's short but exciting career hasn't received more attention from fringe movie fanatics. Her resume boasts leading roles in the legendary Ganja and Hess, the overlooked Lord Shango, and such late night TV staples as Night of the Cobra Woman and The Beast Must Die, not to mention supporting parts in cultish favorites like Putney Swope, Into the Dragon, and Switchblade Sisters. The talented and beautiful actress who has been absent from the screen for nearly 25 years, this interview is from 2000, so it's a bit old, can think of at least one possible explanation. I didn't get a chance to do too many interviews, she says with a laugh, one of many that punctuate her comments. Most of the movies I starred in didn't come out when they were supposed to or never came out at all. And if the movies aren't going to be released, the studios aren't going to do anything to promote them. So you miss out on all that publicity that can lead to other jobs. Ironic, considering Clark first reached the public eye as a model for various New York magazines and newspapers during the late 1960s. A wonderful time, she said, because more and more opportunities like that were opening for black women. These gigs led to bit parts in late 60s films like For Love of in what of in why for love of ivy midnight cowboy and most notably putney swope robert downey's trailblazing comedy about a black businessman who takes over a stuffy predominantly white madison avenue ad agency with her sights set on more substantial movie roles, Clark enrolled in Irene Daly's School of the Actors Company, continued her dramatic studies with Paul Mann and Stella Adler, and appeared on stage in Richard Reich's Pets, which later became a lurid drive-in movie starring Candace Ralston. A small part in how Ashby's The Landlord put Clark in contact with its screenwriter, Bill Gunn, who also wrote Ganja and Hess, a respected stage director, actor, playwright, novelist who had just signed a deal with Warner Brothers to write and direct his first feature. Bill sent me a script he had written called Stop and asked me if I'd play one of the leads, she recalls. Stop, which featured cinematography by Owen Roisman of The Exorcist, received some publicity at the time for being the second major studio production helmed by an African-American director after Gordon Parks' The Learning Tree. The film was slapped with an X rating, heavily re-edited against Gunn's wishes, and eventually shelved by the studio. Being involved in a situation like that is extremely frustrating, Clark says, because there really is nothing you can do about it. You can't affect any change or any kind of decisions, so mentally and emotionally, you just have to put it away. Despite the disappointment of seeing her first major screen performance confined to a studio vault where it remains to this day, the New York-born actress relocated to Tinseltown, Hollywood, and landed a part in Beware the Blob, aka Son of the Blob, which was released in 1972, and was a sequel to the straight-faced 1958 sci-fi horror movie The Blob. I'm the first person who dies, Clark says. The blob gets out, kills the cat, and then kills me. That was quite an experience. I'd never been consumed by a blob before, nor have I since. Beware the blob put her career on the fright, not right, the fright track. Later that year, Clark traveled to the Philippines to star in Night of the Cobra Woman for Roger Corman's New World Pictures. 
Co-written and directed by former Andy Warhol associate Andrew Meyer, the film stars Clark as Lena Arusa, a priestess who was bitten by a cobra during World War II and now, years later, needs snake venom to stay eternally young. Eventually, she transforms into a cobra completely, but not before turning several men into exhausted senior citizens after a few hours of lovemaking, so she's sort of like a succubus character. For the transformation scenes where she becomes a snake, it was two hours in the makeup chair, she groans, and it was so hot in the Philippines that the stuff would immediately start melting and dripping off my face. They were shooting day for night, too, so I'd always be in a room with black fabric over the windows, and it would be 95 degrees in there. A year and a half later, Clark returned to the Philippines to appear in Black Mamba, a 1974 film for actor-producer John Ashley. In Black Mamba, Clark played a witch who steals the ring of her deceased lover and then places a curse on the man's widow, who is being courted by a handsome doctor. Shot back-to-back -back with the better-known movie Savage Sisters, the film remained unreleased until after Ashley's death in 1997. In the U.S., Clark kept herself busy excuse me, with guest appearances on Bonanza, The Bill Cosby Show, The Immortal, Marcus Well BMD, The Rookies, McLeod, and several episodes of The Mod Squad, and turned in solid supporting performances in early 70s crime thrillers like Clay Pigeon, Slaughter, Newman's Law, and Incident on a Dark Street. Much has been written about the damage inflicted upon Ganja and Hess, which came out in 1973, which is what we watched, the fascinating, barely released vampire film that reunited the late writer-director Bill Gunn and actress Marlene Clark three years after Warner Brothers shelved their first collaboration, the X-rated erotic thriller Stop. I loved working with Bill because he was so imaginative, creative, and totally committed to the material, Clark says. Ganja and Hess was his dream, his vision, and there wasn't a thing he wouldn't do to make it work. And in the process, he brought people together. Film crews had been traditionally all white, yet here was a crew that was totally diverse, and their devotion to Bill and to what he was trying to say was really quite impressive. Also impressive were the challenging roles that Gunn wrote for Clark and her co-star, the late Dwayne Jones from Night of the Living Dead. You couldn't wish for a better character, the actress says of Ganja, the mysterious woman who shares the curse of immortality and the thirst for human blood with Dr. Hess Green. There are so many levels to her personality. She's such a collection of contradictions. Playing that part was very rewarding, and Dwayne was great to work with. He did a terrific job. Ganja and Hess was the only American film screened during Critics Week at the 1973 Cannes Film Festival, where it was named one of the 10 best American films of the decade. It opened at a Manhattan theater a few weeks later. The first time I saw the movie was at the opening night screening in New York, Clark reveals. There was a splashy party afterwards, and being the lead actress, I was pretty much the star of the party. Nothing like that had ever happened to me before. It was wonderful. The bubble burst the next day, however, when almost every New York critic panned the film. And Ganja and Hess was a brilliant fucking movie, and we all loved it on the live stream. It was like really, really, really good. And I will put in the description box a list of all these films by Marlene Clark that I'm mentioning. When I read the reviews, I thought they didn't get it, Clark remembers. Many critics believe that black people have to make very straightforward and literal movies. So Bill was really an enigma to them. They just did not understand what he had done. Ganja and Hess is like a really abstract sort of art house film about these black vampires. And it's like very dreamy. It's like filmed in this like very sort of, again, abstract, you know, type of way. Gunn's unique cinematic treatment of African-American spirituality and vampirism was also lost on the film's distributor, Kelly Jordan Enterprises. After a one-week run in Manhattan, the 110-minute version was pulled from circulation and replaced by a 76-minute bastardization called Blood Couple, with new credits listing someone else as the director. For nearly 25 years, it was this version that viewers were subjected to, both in theaters and on video. Under such misleading titles, as Double Possession, Black Evil, Black Vampire, and Blackout, The Moment of Terror. It never found much of an audience, Clark says, but a number of industry people saw it, especially in New York, so I was offered some other movies. One of those was The Beast Must Die, an entertaining chiller. The 1974 fil film stars Calvin Lockhart as a wealthy big game hunter who invites six people to his mansion during a full moon, convinced that one of them is a werewolf. Viewers are allowed to guess who, who the lycanthrope was during a 30-second werewolf break near the movie's end.
After hearing that the Beast Must Die is now available on video as Black Werewolf, Clark sighs. Nothing I'm in ever stays the same. My movies are retitled, re-edited, re-released. People get into fights. They take their names off the credits. It just goes on and on and on. Her next genre offering, Lord Shango, released in 1975, continued the unfortunate trend. Misleadingly advertised as a voodoo spin on The Exorcist, this strange, often confusing supernatural tale with a plot involving possession, sacrificial rituals, and the conflict between tribal roots and the Southern Baptist tradition left audiences scratching their heads. After Lord Shango bombed in several cities, the title was changed to Soulmates of Shango and dumped into drive-ins and urban action theaters on the bottom half of a double bill with a film called Ghetto Warriors, aka The Black Gestapo. The film sank without a trace until a few years ago when Xenon Entertainment released it on video as The Color of Love. Switchblade Sisters, released in 1975, Jack Hill's Wild Girl Gang rendition of Shakespeare's Othello came next. Originally released as the Jezebels, the incomparable drive-in favorite features Clark in the role of Muff, the leader of an all-female Black revolutionary organization that joins forces with the titler gang to rub out a bunch of murderous drug dealers. It wasn't a very big part, she admits, but it was fun to play. Scenes included a blazing shootout where Clark fired a machine gun from atop a modified car tank that crushes a rival gang member against a brick wall. I have to see this movie. The TV show Sanford and Son was still a hit when Clark went on to join the cast during the fall of 1976. As Janet Lawson, the fiance of Lamont Sanford, the actress received her widest exposure to date, as well as a rare opportunity to exercise her comedic skills. That was so much fun, she says, of her one season stint on the popular sitcom. I mean, how could you be around Red Fox and not have fun? He had us laughing all the time. More TV appearances followed, including What's Happening and Barnaby Jones among them, but by then it was the early 1980s, quality roles for black actresses were few and far between, and colorblind casting was still years away. That's when it ended for me, Clark says. The parts dried up and I didn't do much after that. There just wasn't anything to go out for anymore. It was around this time that Clark, who once described herself to Black Stars magazine as a lady who can't picture herself being anything other than an actress, decided to turn her back on Hollywood and direct her energies elsewhere. Today, she's the manager of a successful restaurant in Los Angeles, and even though she's still a member of the Screen Actors Guild, she rarely auditions for anything other than commercials. I can't pursue it anymore, she says flatly. That part of my life is over now, and the best thing for me to do is leave it that way. Otherwise, I'd just be out there chasing my tail. Marlene Clark, a scream queen hidden figure. Like I said, I'm going to include uh, the names of the sort of horror films that she was in that I talked about in this video in the description box if you guys want to look them up. And I will also have links to this uh, article in full as well as some other information on Marlene Clark in the description box as well. So happy Halloween, happy Wednesday, happy Hidden Figures Day. If you guys are going to be going out or going out with your kids or staying in or whatever you're going to be doing, have fun, be safe, have a great time. And I will see you guys soon with another video. Peace.